Hey guys, welcome to this week's podcast episode for the Financial Freedom Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Christopher Liu, and we're recording this on Memorial Day. So wherever you are, thanks for tuning in. Like I said, I'm always focusing on who are the top performers in every industry, getting their insights, distinctions, compiling them and sharing them with the world. So today I'm at, I'm really happy to welcome Ruthie to the show. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's uh, that's a big topic. So yeah, let's talk about it. <laughs> yeah, I know we were backstage talking. Similar to the physician community, when people think, when you tell people you're a physician, you know, people automatically think dollar signs, they see dollar signs, you know, similar to realtors, when you say you're a realtor, people assume you're closing a lot and you actually um, have the view that this is not true. So tell us more about that. Right. So I'm, um, of course, I'm a realtor. Um, I'm also a real estate coach and I own a real estate brokerage and a real estate school. So um, <laughs> I'm kind of wrapped around, you know, that entire umbrella of real estate. And um, however, I came from an education background. I have a master's in education and teaching English as a second language. And um, my last job before I took the plunge um into um, real estate was actually coaching um, educators. I was a technology coach with the Apple Connect Ed grant. Um, so I'm very much about the education. So I've always approached my real estate business as an educator rather than simply just a salesperson. So one of the things that it's very common to hear is, especially now on TikTok and things like that, is that you're going to just make quick, easy money in real estate. And, you know, a lot of people think, hey, I can do it as a side hustle. I'll sell two, three houses a year. And that's, you know, that's vacation money. And for some it is, you know, don't get me wrong. There's always the exception to the rule. However, um, I do see a lot, especially, you know, during COVID and after COVID, the market completely changed and it was very different than ever. And we saw thousands, if not more uh, people joining, getting the real estate licenses um, just because it seemed easy. Right. So what I noticed, you know, just from being in this business for, you know, close to eight years now. And like I said, I coach agents, I own and operate a brokerage is that that is the biggest misconception that you're just going to come in and make money because with real estate, it's not that way. It's literally a six, you know, if you do it in person, maybe a six week course, like maybe, you know, a few hours a week. And the test is, I mean, I, I think I've, I've taken, you know, I feel like I've taken college exams that, you know, in English comp one or two that were more difficult than the real estate test in most states. So um, with that being said, can you imagine the gaps in different people's success based on their preparation prior to real estate? Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a, it's a big misconception because if everyone was prepared the same, then you could expect the same outcome. But everyone is coming from different backgrounds. So that's, you know, it's not all, it's not a one size fits all at all. So it's so interesting. I had a couple of colleagues in in college. They 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 wanted to get their um they got their real estate brokerage and, and one of them got their Series Seven and they were like, yeah, it's you know because basically you're selling uh, securities and you know you're licensed to do so and it was like you didn't have to go through all this like rigorous you know med med school dental loss all this stuff. Um, so it's quite interesting and basically when as a realtor, you're facilitating the transaction. So basically, basically you don't have skin in the game between the, but um, the other thing is like realtors, I have, you know, a couple of realtor friends and colleagues and, but they basically took their, they, they treated it as a full-time income. And they basically said, this may not last. So they invested into other things, you know, equities, real estate, cash flowing uh, businesses, entities, et cetera. So talk to this idea about how your income is not financial security. It's what you do with it, you know, how you spend it, your expense, all, you know, all of that. Tell us, tell the audience more about that. Absolutely. So with real estate, just like you said, I mean, it's, first of all, it's based on the, a lot of it is so dependent on the market, right? It's dependent on the market, on your skills, on your ability to market 
get yourself on your ability to, you know, facilitate that transaction with integrity, you know, recurring business. So with all of that being said, when the market is up, you know, everyone is just so excited and they're, you know, everyone is not everyone, but, you know, every realtor that does this full time, usually they see their, their income spike up. And what you see a lot is that most of them, right, um, nothing changes in their original plan, like in their big life plan. Um, it's just when the market is good, they're buying, you know, more expensive cars, they're um, taking more expensive trips where, you know, there's more Instagram photo opportunities versus what a very small my you know realtors do which is you know reinvest or even reinvest in their business itself in their systems because a lot of what i do is that i work with realtors who are thinking okay this is great income um how do i stabilize it so stabilizing that requires foundations, requires systems, requires more knowledge than just like selling a car, right? Because you're running an entire business. So when that happens, um, you know, well, first of all, a lot of them do not have that. So they have these ups and downs and they're not prepared for the downs. And during the ups, they just blow it. <laughs> so um, that seems to be a, a reoccurring thing. So with building like really strong foundations and helping these agents really take their business models from like, hey, this is a job depending on the market to, hey, this is a retirement plan. Um, here's my foundation. Here's here's what I'm going to accomplish. I'm going to invest into this part of my business so that later on I can have an exit plan. Later on I can either get out or and you know sell my business because with real estate it's not like insurance so with insurance you can sell your book right if you're doing uh, i guess casualty and home and auto and all of that you can sell a book of business to the next agent and get out of the get out of the game with real estate it's literally what you yourself can produce daily so the moment a lot of people stop working they stop making money so that is not income security at all because we have no, you know, as obviously as a doctor, you know, we have no control of, you know, our health necessarily of life events and things like that. So there's a lot of gaps in that. And that's what I usually help cover because if there's no, I mean, you know, you have to plan out a retirement plan. Otherwise you're sitting there 85 years old and still having to sell the next transaction to make your bills. And that's not, you know, where you want to be. That's not freedom. Mm. Yeah, I love that. And but basically, we have we were talking uh, backstage, and I and I love this idea how you basically you structured around education versus sales, like say, like so you you actually you have you know you created this business, but you know within any industry, there's you know you can sell the tools, you can sell the product, um, sell education. It also reminds me of this idea of the you know the thirty thousand dollar millionaire that we you know is driving a fancy car. You know, it doesn't make a lot of money, but you know, all of his friends think, and then um, you know, he has to, he has to basically, he has to work for the rest of his life. So, um, so tell us more. So you talk about um, this real estate industry as a lot of traditional industry. It's a legacy. There's not much diversity. There's marginalized. So you help with that. You help with, uh, you know. Oh, I'm so sorry. You froze there for just a minute. You're going to have to repeat that. I apologize. So you talk about this idea, representation, usually traditional, a lot of the traditional industries, legacy industries, financial are all, you know, dominated by particular race, gender. And so you're speaking up to give empowerment for underrepresented communities, especially for the female. So tell us more about the work that you're doing in that area. Um, as, a, as a coach, of course, um, I have a specific program that I work mainly with women, right? Um, because a lot of the real estate coaching is very, same with the financial and everything, is very male dumb. And while real estate is one of those wonderfully balanced um, careers where there's a lot of women 
doing, you know, that do real estate. And I feel like it's one of the few that it's almost even the coaching and the education and all of the models have been developed by men. And it's usually men who have wives at home and they take care of every other aspect of their business. So they come, you know, they come out and they're like, hey, um, you know, these are the methods. If you do this, you're going to succeed and your business is going to be amazing. And then you have all of these, you know, women, we come into the force of, you know, the workforce of real estate. And I'll give you an example. Whenever I started into real estate, I was about six months pregnant. So I, you know, I was working my tech education job before I loved it, but I just thought, hey, it's going to be a good idea to have more flexibility. I have this baby coming. So literally my first, I would say at least a year, year and a half in real estate, I had a baby tied to my chest. Like I had, you know, that those carrier things and I was showing houses with a baby. I was making my calls, you know, between the baby snaps. I had to have, um, you know, my support system be super strong to either take the baby, um, you know, and my husband, of course, he, he worked a nine to five. So I didn't have the luxury that a lot of the, a lot of my colleagues did. And I was in a class a very smart, very amazing man who could say, hey, I'm going to work and they could come to the office, you know, get their their morning started early, take their calls. Meanwhile, I'm at home, you know, making sure this baby's fed, getting my other two out the door for school. And somehow I'm supposed to accomplish the same. And, um, you know, I, I was able to create systems to really help me. But again, that comes from having been in, in management for so many years before, which most people don't have that, uh, that ability. So Coming into a business, especially as a minority, right? Because one of the things that it's on the like the, you know, uh, and I started out as a KW agent. So on the, um, you know, the education, one, you know, 101, it's like, hey, go door knock, right? Um, door knock your neighborhood. There's a, a, a wonderful, you know, pioneer in, um, in real estate, Diana Kokoska. And she has this epic story of how she was, I don't remember, she was recently divorced or widowed or something. And she put her two little babies in this little red wagon. And she walked around her neighborhood and knocked on doors and became the neighborhood realtor. Um, idealistically, that was fantastic to think about, right? That was fantastic for me as a mom. I was like, oh my gosh, I can totally do that. Um, however, I don't know if you stay on, you know, and, and that never changes, right? That is the same guidebook that they give every agent. And this, she did this back in like the seventies, right? You give this to young agent and that's, again, it sounded great to me. I live in a, in a safe neighborhood. I didn't think anything of it. However, when I tried it, the reception was a little bit off. And I was like, but, you know, it's I'm walking around with my uh, it was a stroller. It wasn't a wagon, but, you know, with my baby and I'm a safe person to knock on the door. But it was still iffy. it still felt weird. Um, it didn't quite feel safe. Right. Um, and not from like a, a any particular situation. But then you think like, OK, a, a gentleman opens the door. He sees you by yourself. They, you know, they look around. They're like, you're by yourself. Right. Um, anything can happen from there safety wise. And imagine if you are a black man or a Latino man or, you know, in just the past couple of weeks, you've heard of so many tragedies of people knocking on the wrong door and things going really, really wrong. So even from that perspective, the book was not written for everyone to succeed. And that is all that repetitively is put out for agents. Every co I've hired every coach in the book to to work with. And every time it's like, do this and you know go to your go to your parents wealthy friends and go to where you know all of the attorneys in your family hang out and i'm like well i have no attorneys in my family i have no parents wealthy friends um you know again it's it's kind of as a woman it is definitely i don't care what color or race you are it is dangerous to knock on strangers doors because anyone can just grab you and take you inside and then you're done for right so there's so many things that aren't quite right for everyone. So what I do is that I take those, um, you know, I kind of take those things and make it okay for it to not be okay. Because um, I have, you know, as a woman, we always feel guilty for not being able to do the things that everyone else is doing. And as a mom, either you're working too hard or you're parenting too hard. And I make it okay for agents to say, you know what, I don't feel safe in this situation. Let's find an alternative that works. 
or, you know, maybe I'm raising a family or I'm taking care of my elderly parents. You know, I, I'm the oldest. I'm the oldest in an immigrant family. And that comes with certain responsibilities. I have to take care of the elders. I have to take care of everyone else. So it's OK to say, oh, you know what? I don't wake up at five in the morning to um, to go to the gym and make, you know, 800 calls before noon. No, I don't. Um, I wake up. I get my kids ready for school. I do A, B, C and D. And then at this time, I rather than making 8,000 calls, I schedule coffees or I do, you know, I just make it okay for to develop a system that fits their lives versus them having to literally break themselves to fit a different, um, like the book, the the current book. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And um, like I said, uh, in this day and age, there's more talk about representation and empowerment and especially, you know, physical safety, psychological safety, emotional. One thing is, uh, you know, with this real estate market, um, this post pandemic world, looming recession, interest rates, commercial real estate crisis, what do you see on the horizon navigating it? And again, this is not financial advice is just you know, we're just discussing right. ideas here. <laughs> um, well, you know, um, I've always looked at things like it, it's a matter of opportunity and ability to seize those opportunities, right? If it if everything around it were perfect, it wouldn't be an opportunity. It would just be another Tuesday, right? So um very often I tell people, hey, if you are, you know, yes, interest rates are high. Right. But what do interest rates do? They lower, you know, interest rates are up, home prices are down. Right. The way I do my investing is that I don't mind buying a property under, you know, under with a really high interest rate because you can always refinance the interest rate. However, if you were in last seasons and you pay it and you paid 50,000 over on a home, you're never going to get your 50,000 over back. They were overvalued. <laughs> While with a interest rate, I mean, yes, that is an it's part of it, but it's it can be temporary that can be changed and you cannot change what you paid for that house. So that's the first thing as it comes to, um, you know, to properties and the risk. It's it's very important that people realize, like, it's all about ceasing that opportunity. And the second part is with um, commercial real estate. You know, it depends on where you are and what type of building you're purchasing and what the the demand is. At the end of the day, same thing. You own something with real estate. If you even if you just pay what it's worth and it doesn't increase in value and you see yourself like, oh, my gosh, it's not cash flowing or it's not. I, I need to to not have this payment. You just sell it. It's 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 a tangible asset. So it's not always um, as long as you're not overpaying for it. You know, when you, you sell it, the interest rate is gone. When you um, refinance it, same thing. You can lower it. So it's it's a lot about just not getting analysis paralysis, mm. which is what most people do. Most people are like, "Ooh, it looks good. The market looks great," and then they just don't act on it, and then they look back. Right. Um, I bought my very first property back in like 2006 and then my second one in like 2008, uh, well, 2009. And I just remember, you know, at this point, I have friends, you know, my age that are, you know, maybe on their first home, their second home. And they're just like, oh, my gosh, I wish I would have bought back then. But there were those same friends that were like, oh, my gosh, your interest rate is going to be like five or six percent. Why would you do that? Right. I refinanced a couple of years later down to like a two, you know, so um, definitely not one of those things where it's about seizing the opportunity, doing your research and the market is going to, you know, the market's going to market. And you just have to to know your your pockets and, and how to invest. Yeah. Yeah. There's always um, just like you said, there's always niches. There's always opportunities. Real estate is, is kind of um, right now is very, you know, you have the global macro picture, but then you also have like individual local areas. Mm -hmm. Some are flourishing. And, um, you know, main thing is uh, don't, you know, avoiding 2008, you know, over hyping, over lever, um, you know, getting in over your head, uh, you know, running the numbers, cash flowing, uh, all of that. Uh, and then the other thing is, what's interesting is that now a lot of you know people are they're interested in real estate and they get this they get confused between home ownership and real estate investor, which are yes. two totally different things. They they walk into a house, they're like, oh my god, this is so beautiful, a million dollars, and you know, it's not that won't 
bid for an investment property, but you know, maybe for your home or whatever. But um, yeah, really interesting discussion. Um, how can people contact you, follow you, reach out to you, and uh, check you out on social media? Yeah, so they um, obviously they can follow me on I'm on Instagram on I'm, I'm on a lot of things, but um, if they I have actually um, written a book on um, mm-hmm. this is for realtors. Not they don't have to be super new. They can be um, you know whether you're in your first year or in your in your tenth year. If you haven't reached that stability, then it's definitely a quick read, and they can go to real and download a free copy of this as well as um, they can do a, um, a broker realtor um, survey there where I can I will then give them like a free consultation to kind of assess how their marketing is doing and how their business um, actually stands from a from an outside look. Yeah. And for all the audience out there, um, all of Ruthie's resources will be in the links and show notes. And um, let's thank her. Uh, for providing a different slant to the traditional real estate guests on the podcast. And um, with that, thanks so much for coming onto the podcast. Thank you so much for having me.